I know I wouldn't get up before nine, you know, at a conference to hear someone talk unless I was really interested in what they had to say. So, uh, thank you. Um, I want to start out, I guess I should introduce myself just in case some of you don't know who I am. So I'm David Schwartz. I'm currently the CTO at Ripple. Um, and I'm one of the original developers of what we now call the XRP ledger. Um, and I want to start out just with a little bit of a personal statement um, that I think is important, especially given what's been happening with the markets lately. I just want to say um, the markets are telling us we're all in this together. It, it is not guaranteed that blockchain will succeed. It is not guaranteed that cryptocurrencies will take over the world. Those are not things that are sure to happen. Uh, this is a nascent uh, ecosystem. It's immature. And uh, we need smart people to work in it, and we're chasing them away. Um, we're being very militant. There's infighting. I know everybody, think, everybody, has pers everybody thinks they have their own money on the line, and so someone who disagrees with you is taking food out of your children's mouths. That's, we all want the same thing, and I, I, I just don't want, I want us to stop chasing smart people away. Um, I know that there was some conversation on Twitter recently about whether Ripple wants uh, other cryptocurrencies to succeed, other businesses to succeed. Um, we have our spring effort. You know, we've been, we've been trying to help. Um, I have a smartphone in my pocket. I think probably just about everybody in this room does. Now, imagine if you work for Twitter. That's great. Like, every single person in this room probably can access Twitter anytime they want. And I'm sure most of you have home internet access. That's great for Twitter, too. You're their target market. If I'm a marketer at Twitter, I'm not thinking, how do I get phones in people's pockets so they can access Twitter? How do I get people on the internet, right? My target market is people who already have phones and people who already have home internet access. They don't have that because of anything Twitter did. They have that because of the ecosystem. Even Twitter's competitors, Facebook competes with Twitter. But Facebook is one of the reasons that there's an ecosystem. It's one of the reasons that we have high-speed Wi-Fi. It's, it, this ecosystem was built by uh, an enormous number of companies who all had their stake. If we're going to rebuild payments, if we're going to rebuild the way money works, no one person or project is going to do it. We need the ecosystem. So please stop, stop chasing people out of the ecosystem. We, we want smart people. Anyway, on to the actual reason why, uh, why you're here. Um, under the hood, the XRP ledger. Um, in, in late 2011, uh, Jed McCaleb kind of had this idea that proof of work was not the secret sauce in Bitcoin, that it, that it was other properties that I'll talk about in a little bit, and that there was a better way, um, or at least another way possibly, using what we would call federated Byzantine agreement. Um, but let me talk a little bit about what digital currencies are, just so that we kind of have the, the scope. Uh, they're rooted in blockchains. And by blockchains, I, I almost literally just mean chains of blocks. I, I, think, I think this is an important thing, too, that the term blockchain has become somewhat um, muddied. It's a data structure. It's, a ch it's literally a chain of blocks. Um, to be a little bit more precise, what a blockchain is, is it's a system in which you have data structures that show the state transitions in the system. So a blockchain is a fancy name for a database. It changes state. And those state changes are documented in blocks that allow anybody to check the validity of those state changes. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. There are no system administrative functions. Bitcoin doesn't have an administrative function. XRP doesn't have an administrative function. Litecoin doesn't have administrative functions. Ethereum, there's no administrative functions. Um, everybody accesses the system on an equal plane. They have some portions of this. They have maybe their own assets, but they, act, they have privileged access to their own assets, but that's it. Nobody has privileged access to anybody else's assets. And, and rules are public. In other words, every one of us in this room can tell if a Bitcoin transaction is valid. We don't need to ask anybody else. That's important. And state is public. And I think the most important thing, if you ask me, like, what is the breakthrough in Bitcoin? What is the aha? What is the insight? What is the magic secret sauce? It is that last bullet point that all participants can enforce the rules. What that means is if you run a Bitcoin full node, and this is true of pretty much every blockchain, the only way for someone to say, I have a Bitcoin, is to demonstrate to you that they have that Bitcoin in compliance with the system's rules. Every individual participant can enforce those system rules. And that means that anything that violates those rules is essentially impossible. It, uh, obviously, a bug might allow us to, a, a bug might mean that the software doesn't enforce the rules we think it does. Bitcoin has had two of those. But we fix them, and we move on. And hopefully, the number of those bugs is finite. 
But the fear of a bug specifically targeting you, you log into your bank and your money's gone, and you say to the bank, what happened to my money? Imagine if the bank couldn't tell you your money was gone without proving that you authorized the transfer of it. That, that is a huge difference that eliminates any number of threat models and costs associated with software development. And that's one of the reasons that I think blockchain could be a data structure that could become much more popular in many types of applications where a huge fraction of the difficulty of the implementation and operation is ensuring that the system's rules aren't violated. Uh, if you imagine you build a system and you deploy it, part of the cost of operating that system, let's say you use a traditional centralized database, Part of the cost of operating that system is making sure that that centralized database isn't compromised, because if the database is compromised, everybody listens to what it says. If you don't trust any centralized database, that whole problem just goes away. And, and I think centralized databases have been oversold. Uh, we've been told, oh, that's a solved problem, you know, just use a centralized database. They're not cheap. They're not reliable. No major blockchain has had, has had any downtime in the past two or three years. What centralized database service can say that? They have com centralized databases are complex. They have failover. They, what, if you, what, if they, what if the backup thinks the active is running and the active thinks the backup is down? And you have all these complex failure modes that cause downtime. Blockchains don't have that. Um, XRP is the digital asset that emerged from, the, from what we now call the XRP ledger. I think it's interesting to compare some of the differences in its attributes to those of, of I pick Bitcoin just because it's the biggest one. Um, federated Byzantine Agreement gives faster finality. You could argue proof of work never gives finality. That's probably, you know, it gives relative certainty over a much longer period of time. Um, but what I really want to talk about is the subject of this talk, which is the under the hood on the XRP ledger. But I should point out we've had four, over 45 million XRP ledgers have closed um, without any incident. The major innovations that, uh, that I think I should call it, number one is Federated Byzantine Agreement. And that means it's not expensive to produce consensus. We don't produce a consensus by piling expensive work. We, we reach consensus simply by agreeing. And when I first started working on using Federated Byzantine Agreement for a, in a blockchain context, I didn't think it would be robust and reliable. And it turned out that it is extremely robust and reliable. And we'll talk more about why. Uh, but the other innovations, uh, transactions operate on views and this is important. Manipulating a digital ledger that has cryptographic properties is expensive. Um, there's hashing involved. There's digital signatures. So when a transaction operates, it doesn't operate on the ledger directly. It operates on a view, which is like a more efficient structure that sits between the transactor and the ledger. And the major advantage that we get out of views that I think is something that really should be adopted across this industry is invariant violation checking. I think. If, if I had to call out one innovation that happened in the XRP ledger after its initial deployment as a major innovation, it would be this invariant checking. I, I, can't, I, can't, uh, I can't overstress how important this is. Let me explain to you what invariant checking does. So think about something that you really don't want to happen in a blockchain. Like you don't want there to ever be too many Bitcoins. Like some bug that created more Bitcoins would be terrible. We had one of those uh, in 2013, and it was pretty terrible. And you could have the same imagined problem with the XRP ledger. What if there's some bug that allows people to create XRP? And if you ask me, like, how do I know that there isn't a bug like that, the only answer that I could give you prior to invariant checking would be look over the code, and you won't find any way to create Bitcoins. You won't find any way to create XRP. If you do, tell me. I'll fix it. That'd be really, really bad. But I'm pretty sure in those tens of thousands of lines of code, you won't find a bug like that. Oops, but somebody did in 2013. That's a terrible answer. What you want to have is one line of code that says there can't be more than this number of Bitcoins, or there can't be more than this amount of XRP. And that's what invariant checking does for you. But it does it in a very interesting way. After the transactor operates, the ledger has not been modified. Only the view has. And you can analyze that view to see what changes it makes in the ledger. So if I make an XRP payment to someone, maybe I send them one XRP. So I have one XRP less, and they have one XRP more. If you look at that, that modification, you can see the total change in XRP to the ledger. So one of the changes reduces the amount of XRP in the ledger by one, and one of the changes increases the amount of XRP in the ledger by one. And you can sum those up to say, on net, the transactor does not increase the amount of XRP in the ledger. But if it does, you just throw the view away. So literally, the invariant checker looks at the view, sees if it creates XRP or violates any of the other invariants that we don't want violated. And if it does, the transaction is 
uh, the results of the transaction are replaced with a notation that the transaction violated system invariance. And that notation goes in the ledger. So if we ever did have a transaction that created XRP, you would actually see an entry in the ledger that said, hey, this transaction caused the system to violate the system's rules, and so we threw its results away. And so instead of there being more XRP, there would be a permanent embarrassing notation in the XRP ledger's history that there was a bug. And you could recreate that transaction, you could replay it, you could fix the bug, and you would never have caused any corruption to the public ledger state. Um, that could have prevented the DAO attack. It, it doesn't prevent every attack. It couldn't have prevented the parity wallet attack, but it, it can prevent any attack where you can make a list of the things that you don't want to happen, and those tend to be the worst things. Like someone creating more Bitcoin is one of the worst, you know, worst things that could happen. You can easily identify that and fix it in an invariant checker. So before I was talking about how it turned out that using consensus or federated Byzantine agreement to, to uh, solve the double spend problem turned out to be a lot easier than I thought. And the reason for that is quite interesting. So first of all, all you really need to do is put transactions in order. If I make a double spend, I try to send the same funds to two different people. If we can agree on which transaction goes first, then we can agree that the second transaction doesn't have any funds to transfer. So really, all you need is a global transaction ordering. I say all you need, that's obviously not a trivial thing, but it's important to understand that the double spend problem reduces to putting transactions in order. And you can put transactions in order just by hash, like transactions have a hash, so you can just, you could literally sort them. But that doesn't solve the problem by itself because I might sort two transactions and you might be sorting three transactions, and so you might, the transaction that you put first might be a transaction I didn't see. So you need some way to agree on which transactions shall be executed as a unit. And that's precisely what consensus does in the XRP ledger. There's a voting system which, where nodes vote on whether or not to include transactions in the current round. And their test is objective. If the transaction executes successfully, and if the transaction was seen before the round begins, you vote to include it in the round. If it doesn't meet those tests, you don't vote to include it in the round. And all that you need to maintain consensus, the only possible scenario, first of all, if it's an invalid transaction, there's no consensus issue, there's no double spend issue. Every honest participant will never process the transaction in any way because they see that it's invalid. So that's not a problem. The problem occurs when I see two valid transactions in one order and you see two valid transactions in another order. And that's solved by agreeing to put them in the same unit and sorting them. Um, the reason consensus is not that much of a problem is that the only disagreement that honest participants can wind up with is two, two participants. One says, I saw this transaction before the consensus round began. And the other one says, I didn't see this transaction until after the consensus round began. That can happen. Transactions take time to propagate, and nodes can't necessarily precisely agree on when a transaction round began. And all that you, honest nodes have to do to preserve agreement is agree to defer the transaction for one round. Deferring a transaction for one round just means it executes five seconds later. And it's important to understand that no honest participant would defer the same transaction twice if it was valid. Why? If you've deferred the transaction in round seven, you must have seen the transaction before round eight began. So there's no reason for you to defer it in round eight. So an honest participant who wants to execute their transaction, like if you imagine the nightmare scenario, I have bitcoins, I submit a transaction to spend them, and that transaction never executes. Like that's, that's what we really, really, really don't want to happen, right? That's the case where there's, there's real hard censorship. All we need to prevent that is people agreeing to defer the transaction, and then all honest participants will agree to execute it in the next round. And that is in practice what happens on the XRP ledger. Um, Every honest participant values agreement over everything but correctness. So obviously, correctness is priority one for an honest participant. If you imagine in a Bitcoin or any blockchain system, a transaction that's invalid, no honest participant will ever act on in any way. That's important. Um, correctness is, if the system is not correct, it, it's completely useless. Uh, agreement is priority two. If we have no agreement, then the system is not useful. And priority three is forward progress, because you can have a system that's both correct and in perfect agreement by never executing a transaction. Uh, that's, not, that's obviously not a solution that anybody wants. 
Um, we have a, second, a secondary process called validation that determines afterwards that there actually was an agreement. You can demonstrate through mathematical proofs that you can, consensus cannot be perfect. It doesn't have to be. We optimize consensus for performance. We have the validation process to ensure correctness, to ensure that we know whether or not the consensus process actually succeeded. And a couple of seconds after consensus settles on a ledger, we determine that consensus did in fact settle on that ledger. Network splits can be detected as they happen because you won't hear from the nodes on the other side of the split. Uh, and any sort of treachery is provable. So if, so if a validator defers a transaction in round seven but votes no on it in round eight, like that's provable. And so you can just stop listening to that validator. The XRP ledger is not UTXO based. This is another technological difference uh, between the XRP ledger and Bitcoin. We looked at Bitcoin a lot to see what Bitcoin got right and what it got wrong. And the UTXO uh, decision, the decision to use UTXOs rather than accounts has really only two advantages. So one advantage is that you can execute transactions in parallel a little bit better. Um, because transactions, you know what a transaction affects. A transaction says, hey, I consume these two UTXOs and I produce this new UTXO. You know as long as two transactions don't affect the same UTXOs, which they almost never will, um, you can execute them, you can execute them in parallel. Uh, the other advantage is it makes privacy a little bit better because you have, can have a large number of UTXOs that aren't associated with each other. But there are a lot of disadvantages to the UTXO decision, and so we chose to use an account-based model in the XRP ledger. And the biggest advantage is you can manipulate your account as, as a thing. So for example, you can change the keys on your account. If you, if you have a, an address that you receive bitcoins at and you lose the keys or, you don't, or the person who has the keys you don't trust, you have to give people a new receiving address. Uh, you, probably, you probably heard about like exchange compromises where people have to create new receiving addresses. If your account was an actual thing on the ledger that you could manage, you could just change its key. We also have manage multi-sign where you can designate other accounts that can sign for you and you can specify what assets you want to accept. The XRP ledger is a multi-asset ledger. Um, Non-XRP balances exist between accounts, and accounts can agree to owe each other funds or issue each other funds, and they can use debt settlement as payment. Um, it's essentially kind of like a let system fully built into the XRP ledger or a community credit system. Uh, you have an integrated decentralized exchange so that you can place offers to trade assets. Payments can take those offers. So a payment can actually execute against the decentralized exchange. So I can just say, hey, I want to pay you 53 bitcoins and the system will find the liquidity from the assets I hold to make that payment as cheaply as possible for you. Pathfinding does that for you, and you can have a multi-path payment so you don't have to draw down the same order book to make the payment. Uh, but digital currencies, um, they're not gonna fix payments by themselves. We have a problem in payments, which is that networks don't talk to each other, and that makes payments slow, expensive, and unreliable, uh, and customers want better. Customers do not want to spend three days waiting for a payment. They don't want to call up to find out where their payment is. Um, costs are going to have to come down if we're going to be inclusive and be able to make payments uh, internationally. Blockchains don't solve this problem because blockchains don't even talk to each other, much less do they talk to non-blockchain value, where most of the world's value is today. Um, if we're going to be successful in getting digital currencies out there, they're going to have to connect to existing value systems, and it's going to have to be part of fixing payments more broadly. Uh, an interoperability project that just interoperates blockchains is not going to help blockchain connect to where the world's existing value is going to be for some time. Uh, we need some way to connect all of these networks together. Uh, and I, I just briefly, I, I the Interledger protocol is, uh, I think, a protocol that can connect. It's a minimal protocol. It's very much like IP. It's just a way to move value um, developed through the W3C. Um, it follows the internet stack, just like we've had innovation below IP. We have new ways of transporting IP packets. We'd have innovation above IP. HTTP didn't exist when the internet, when, when, when IP was developed, but we can innovate both on top and below. The same is true of ILP. We can innovate both below it and above it. Um, but the main point that I want to make is that ILP is a micropayment technology. Over a billion ILP payments in 2018. Uh, and there's a reason that's important. You can do everything with a micropayment. Micropayments are kind of like packets. If you think about the way the internet works, it sends a packet to its destination with the best effort. ILP does the same thing. The smarts are at the endpoints, and the same thing is true with ILP. So if I want to send somebody $100, I can just sort of start streaming money at them, and when it gets to $100, I can stop. 
And that is better for a number of reasons. If you're gonna make a payment in one shot, you need to get a quote. But do you get a free quote or do you pay for the quote? If you get a free quote, it's gonna be a terrible quote because you've got a free option. If you're gonna pay for the quote, how many quotes do you pay for? Do you just pay for one and then take it? Do you pay for five quotes and only take one of them? When you stream micropayments, when you make payments by micropayments, you can stream that payment through multiple, through multiple forwarders, and those individual forwarders can stream that payment through multiple forwarders, and you can take advantage of that best path. And if the path is really good, you can stream money faster. And if the path is really bad, you can stream money more slowly. And the net effect is, is that you can manage a payment as a series of micropayments. And I know that sounds kind of crazy to you guys today, but if we lived in the, the circuit switch days of telecom, packet switch, like sending a telephone call over packet switching would sound just as crazy, but it's just as innovative. Uh, if we can develop micropayments that are as cheap as a DNS request, we, we, micropayments can take over the world. We can, put all of, we can put all of the world's payments on a modern payment platform that interoperates between both blockchain and non-blockchain value. Uh, Interledger payments plus digital assets could be that internet of value, that way to move value all around the world. Thank you. If you go by that, uh, I'm not selling my survey.